Okay. All right, here we go. This uh, is the turtle dragon, very beginning stages. Now, this, at this point, uh, I've done the sketch for this, this particular piece in Photoshop, and I probably have that off camera somewhere, but I've transferred that drawing to this panel, which is a gessoed, in this case, it's a gessoed wooden panel, um, but I also work on gessoed masonite panels. Um, and they're prepared pr pretty similarly, but um, we'll probably talk about that in depth a little later. But at this point, I've taken the Photoshop sketch and transferred the drawing through uh, use of a lucigraph projector, uh, pretty old school technology, and just it's given me the pencil outline to start here with. So my first my first uh, task with any oil painting is to try and get the thing laid in in some uh, reasonable value is basically a value study that I'm doing at this point, and I like to use um, browns for most things. Uh, the warmer tones underneath, I think, really help accentuate a lot of color and, and breathe life into into things like whites and things like that uh, that you might, when you're glazing color some of that warmth does really show through so um, the other thing I should mention is when I am doing the oil paintings this stage I usually uh, I'm using linseed oil or not really linseed oil at this point but um, uh, some kind of a paint thinner I use terpenoid it's an odorless paint thinner and liquid uh, so this thing's going to dry pretty much in a couple of hours. Everything that, that I'm going to lay down uh, in, this, in this value study, I'm going to use that medium combination for. It just makes sure that basically the next day I'm ready to go again and it's, it's going to be completely dry. At this point, you know, I'm using, I'm using sort of a kind of a medium small brush uh, just, to, just to get the, the negative spaces roughed in. The brushes will change a little bit, uh, you know. Air, you know, obviously, a, a big area you might want to block in a little bit with with something bigger. But, you know, at this point, I, I can cover this thing pretty pretty efficiently with a, a brush like this, and still have some fairly decent control. This is a flat that's a little beat up, but um, you know, you can get it on the side and get some uh, some smaller marks, some some smaller uh, detail lines. And so, again, I should say that um, I'm looking at, at my study and just kind of trying to duplicate uh, the, va the values for the most part, the value and, the, you know, of course, the drawing uh, that, that I'm looking at in the sketch. The, uh, the colors that I use, you know, I, I should also mention the, the underpainting um, is a little more than just a wash of a single color you know a lot of I, I, you know a lot of people will use burnt umber or something like this and just use use it as more or less like a watercolor where they're thinning it down to get lighter values um, and you know using it more opaquely to get the darker values but I actually use a small string uh, of, of browns I, I the colors I use are lamp black burnt umber uh, burnt sienna and then white and then I usually mix a stage of color on the palette that's between the white and the burnt sienna so I really have five five tones to play with um, I just find that gives me a, a lot more control and I it, you know um, I it, it just helps develop the thing at this stage where I'm not concerned about color but it's definitely more value than I would be able to achieve through just say graphite for example or just a drawing stage and, uh, you know, to me, the lighting is an important thing. It's uh, the value is important to establish. It's really the thing that helps direct your eye uh, even more so than color, ultimately. So it's important to have a good foundation at this point. It's also, uh, you know, in painting this thing in a monochromatic, you know, sort of a, a mini palette, a, a limited palette monochromatic uh, technique like this. It also gives me just the first taste of what this is going to be like painting it all the way to finish. You know, certain areas I can kind of tell are going to go, you know, pretty well. Certain areas I'm going to want to 
leave a little looser. Not not that they're not going to go well, but that they might may not be as much of a focus. Uh, so it, again, it's it's for me it's easier to tell this kind of thing from this sort of a study than from a very linear graphite study. You can see here uh, as I go. This is a smaller filbert. Uh, brush that I use here is long handle filbert. Um, I think it's a number two or it might be a number four. It's a pretty pretty small and it ha you know when they're new they you can get a pretty fine tip on them and uh, they produce a, a nice detail but you can still use them to, to, to cover some ground if you need to. Uh, they're, they're, one of, they're one of my go-to brushes but but you can see that when I get to the smaller using a smaller brush I lean my hand on uh, the mall stick there which is uh, that particular thing is just something that I made and routed over the edges to soften them. I've been using that that same one there for years you can see how how worn it looks uh, it, it, it might need a it might need a coat of paint itself at some point but um you know, it really helps move over the move over the piece without fear of disturbing anything underneath. When you know, a good portion of this is at least still wet at this point. And you can also see a little half of the uh, the piece of reference off to the side there that I was speaking about earlier. You know, some of the things that go through my mind when I'm working like this. I mean, obviously, form is a big one, and it's uh, really the reason to to kind of work in just a monochromatic way like this. It, it lets me go full value without having to deal with all the nuances of, of color at this point and just get this guy who really is an imaginative creature uh, to look like he can be floating and swimming through the ocean. Uh, having the characteristics of light and shadow kind of play upon him and his fins like I think they should be. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, I've used, there's a lot of reference for this piece, uh, turtle, turtle shells and the way that the segments of the turtle join together, uh, the turtle shells join together. It's, you know, the, all of that kind of stuff is taken into consideration when the initial sketch is being done. Um, and it's stuff that I look back at now just to look at the nuances, how the edges of the shell turn up, for example, or might have little spikes, little horns of, uh, little calcium deposits on them that, that uh, the shells generate when they're growing. So that's the kind of stuff I'm looking at and trying to think about and keep in my mind as I'm, as I'm working on this. In this particular case, you know, although this is a common underpainting palette for me, since this is a blue piece, this sort of rusty orange, uh, you know, palette is almost going to be a complement of what the, of what the final palette will be so it should give us some nice some nice color and some nice life in it so that it doesn't sometimes if you paint things all blue or all any one color it, they, they can kind of seem a little dull and lifeless and by having the complement hidden underneath the paint that and have it shine through as it does with oil paint glazes um, I think it, it'll be it's going to be an effective way to to help this piece feel full palette even though it is a really affected blue painting that's underwater. The direction of my brush strokes is something else that I keep in mind um, you know as I'm working I'm you know I'm kind of for lack of a better term I'm sort of making a bunch of X's on the thing and trying to move in different directions not not letting everything lean to one side or the other. Uh, you know there are times when that's appropriate when it can help uh, develop the sense of motion or something like that but in, in uh, for the most case I'm kind of laying it in uh, with the shapes and with the direction in mind but you can see that I kind of go against the grain there a little bit I, I don't want it to seem uh, I, don't, I don't want the direction of the brushes to be the brush strokes to be overwhelming or be the thing that really catch your eye and, and, t and take you out of the take you out of the moment on this one. Now there are places where I, where I will do that though and uh, right away I can see in the underpainting like the tails and the fins there'll be areas where I want softer edges, want uh, the brush strokes to have sort of a motion that they follow. Okay at this point the gla the glaze over the the monochromatic brown is is all pretty much dry as you can see and I'm really just more than anything I'm going to kind of tone that down a little bit. I, 
I think the orange is going to be almost too strong to go into. But I'm also trying to, more than anything, just darken some of the shadow areas uh, in, some of these in, in some of these creatures. You can see uh, in the tail and things like that where I know they're going to be left loose. And I can just start to begin to see what some of those colors may look like there and some of the brushwork that you can see by glazing over this. So that's, you know, I mean, and that's kind of my reason for going at this a little bit at a time. You can kind of see I work my way around the piece. But, you know, I, I could just get a big brush, a two or three inch brush, and just go over the whole thing with a glaze of, I believe this is uh, Payne's Gray, which is kind of a, you know, popular shadow color for me. Um, but again, here now you can see where I start to work it into just the monsters themselves and not so much, or the dragons themselves, not so much the, the negative space. And again, you know, the brush size, you can see with the glazing brush, it's a little bigger um, here. And I could, you know, I, I could have chosen to use a large brush, to use something like a two or a three inch brush. Um, but I just... I felt that the control was better here and I think that as you know I, I started to lay more of this glaze in I realized that I really wanted it to be a little more more opaque and stronger on what would become the shadow sides of these dragons uh, so I really wasn't looking for like an even glaze over the entire thing the other the other uh, sort of subsequent result that glazing with and using liquid in the mix or a dryer like this is that even the subsequent layers of oil paint that go over this that touch this in the next day or so will be you know will be affected just by their adjacent position to this layer and uh, it, it helps things kind of dry a little more quickly now that's not something you always want but a lot of times in commercial work uh, it's helpful um, but for me, it's just the way I, I pretty much like to have the thing dry every morning for the most part. I'm, I'm not going back into the same thing to try and patch into a certain area again. Uh, I would just work over it again. I would glaze into it again. So, you know, I'm trying to, trying to kind of get to a, a level of completion each time, at each pass of the glaze. And you'll see as it develops, they, they get a little slower, obviously, as, as it goes on. But but that's the plan. Uh, since I covered the whole thing and this this mixture was laden with liquid, so I, I knew it was going to dry pretty quick. I wanted to just cover a little bit more of the brown this time and just get um, an underpainting in on this on the background water, even though I'm going to probably go over that again. So really, with a blue piece like this, while I do like the warm underneath it, you know, I start by kind of tempering that down quite a bit, quite a bit before I, I really get started on anything I would consider to be finished. And again, by messing with some of the blue paint at this phase, you know, if I don't like the, the temperature of that blue or the, the chroma of, the, of that blue, I can always make it more violet or, uh, you know, more green. Thank you for checking out part one of the turtle dragon painting process. Be sure to check out part two, where we'll really dive in deep to some of the nuances of the process that go on when I create one of these paintings. Thanks again. See you next time. As we move forward into the Dragons of Nature project, I'm going to be releasing a very limited number of prints with remark drawings on them. We believe that those numbers are going to be as low as 25 prints, 
So all of that information will be available on the website as we release them.